Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I wanted to do a quick video on, I, I spelled it as Adams, like, you know, science. Um, sometimes, most of the time, science falsely so-called. The two Adams in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, just want to remind you, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing. Sometimes we say, I've heard preachers that backpedal and say, well, rightly dividing doesn't necessarily mean it has to do with what's written to you. Now, there's a lot more to rightly dividing. Yes, part of rightly dividing is knowing what's written for us. The whole Bible's written for us. But knowing what is written to us in this dispensation, the church, what we call the church age, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. Things that were written before time were written for our learning. Okay, you can go all throughout the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You can go through this whole book for instruction in righteousness. We can learn how people are corrected, how people are rebuked, all through this Bible. Okay. But when it comes to doctrine, you're going to find it in the Pauline epistles. If you can't, if you grab, like some people will grab from Hebrews, doctrine from Hebrews that's not found in the Pauline epistles. And they'll get really messed up. Why? Because Hebrews is written for Hebrews that are going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. And, and so on and so forth. But remember, rightly dividing sometimes can mean understanding that God never promised, for this study, God never promised that the whole Bible would be in chronological order. Part of rightly dividing is understanding when a story is being repeated. Okay? Some people can't get that. They get messed up in Revelation. I think it's chapter 6 or chapter 8 where it's a, it goes a synopsis of the whole time of Jacob's trouble and then it goes back and tells you in more detail. And it does that a lot throughout the whole Bible. And you can get really messed up if you don't rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? So, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, we read, And so it was written, the first Adam was made a living soul. And we're going to read about that. And the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So the reason I didn't say two Adams like A, D, A, M, is because there actually is two Adams mentioned in the Bible. The first Adam, created son. And then you have the second Adam, the begotten Son, God manifests in the flesh. Okay, not God the Son, but the Son of God. We've talked about this in other studies. There's a big difference. Son of means that Jesus is connected to God the Father, the soul. The body and soul are connected. When you say God the Son, you take Jesus, break him away from capital G God the Father, and you make him his own lowercase g God. There is no God, the Son, in Scripture. Just so you guys understand what I'm talking about. And I'm gonna, people fight. You know, there's people out there, they're smarter than me, they're smarter than you, brothers and Christ, when you try to preach the truth to them. They're just smarter than anybody. Okay? You've got people out there that get so prideful that you, they think you have to come to them to get the knowledge of the truth. This is where we get the truth, brothers and Christ. If I'm right, it's not because I'm right. It's because the Bible's right. And if I'm wrong, it's not because the Bible's wrong. It's because I'm wrong. Okay, this book is always right, and this is your foundation on matters of faith and practice. Okay, you should be reading this book every morning, brothers and Christ, starting your day with the Word of God, ending your day with the Word of God. You should be studying this. You should be not just memorizing Scripture, but hiding God's Word in your heart, meaning living it. God says, don't do this, get it out of your life. God says, do this, make sure you get it in your life, and you start doing it like prayer. Giving God thanks in all things, giving Him glory in all things. Okay. Praising Him for who He is and what He's done for you. Okay. But there are two Adams in there. But what I'm talking about is back in Genesis. Okay, so was there two Adams created in Genesis 1 and 2? And you'll see what, where I'm getting with this study once we get through this. So please bear with me, brothers and sisters of Christ. Those that are still, uh, you know, have grace for me and are still watching. Uh, Genesis 1.26 And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, I've always got to bring this up because some brethren will hear me in other studies and they'll get confused. 
I believe, according to the scripture, if you do a word study, some brethren, are, they're not doing word studies anymore, they're not doing expository studies anymore, and their subject studies aren't based off of subject studies on the Bible, their subject studies are based off worldly things. Uh, be careful, we've got to get back to doing some word studies sometimes, brothers of Christ, but if you do a word study on the word image, you'll realize that, this is a rabbit trail, but you'll realize that it's always something physical that you can see. Image here is referring to the body by itself. You can't see a spirit, you can't see a soul. So Adam was made in the image of God, and after his likeness, body, soul, and spirit. That's where the body, soul, and spirit come in, is likeness, not image. And I was not created, even though I'm a man, I was not created in the image of God. I was created in the image of Adam. Adam was created in the image of God. And it talks about that, we won't get into it, but... Uh, Adam's first son that he had, it said it was made in Adam's image. A son, not a daughter, a son was made in Adam's, in Adam's image. But we see here, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God, the Father, said, let us, body, soul, and spirit, you have the Holy Spirit there, you have Jesus Christ, the body, the only begotten, or not the only begotten, that's when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. But you have the body of God, Okay, the physical manifestation of God that we can see, the body, in the Old Testament, it's the angel of the Lord. Okay? Anytime someone sees God, they're seeing Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. You can't see the soul. Sin cannot be in God's presence. God the Father, the soul. So the us there, he's talking about the Godhead, body, soul, and spirit. And he says, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Okay. Here it is, 27. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Then it separates it and says, Male and female created he them. That's the likeness part, body, soul, and spirit. But Adam was created in the image of God. But here we see Adam's created. You can even say Eve. Adam and Eve have, were just created. Okay. Jump over to Genesis 2. If everything's got to be in chronological order, go to Gen just the next chapter of Genesis 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works which he had made. He's done creating. That's not hard to understand. He's done creating. He created everything. Jesus Christ, God the Father, through Jesus Christ, the body, created all things. Let's keep reading. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the he earth and heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. Now, verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. Body, soul, spirit. There's the likeness of God. But notice here he's creating mankind. He's, he's creating man all over again. He's creating Adam a second time. Are there two Adams? No. No. It's called, and people can get this part, but it's called, you rightly divide. Okay, he told the story, he did the synopsis of the seven days, now he's going to go back in detail on certain things that he did on those seven days. He's going back into detail on day six, when he created Adam and Eve. He's going to go back into detail. And you keep reading, it says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. This is still the sixth day, because Eve hasn't been created yet. In the, in the retelling, Eve hasn't been created yet. You keep going. Uh, as God causes a, a deep sleep to come over Adam, like death, and took a rib from him and created Eve. So he has Adam and Eve. But we just read back there, he already created them. Is he creating a second set of Adam and Eves? 
No, it's called rightly dividing. Right? God did not promise us the whole Word of God that He would have in our hands today. He never promised it to be chronological order. And the point of this study is to wake brethren up to realize that be careful, there's a lot of false teachings that go out there because they're based off of the fact that it's got to be chronological order for their teaching to work. You have post and mid-trib uh, and revelation, their whole thing is it's got to be chronological order. They take things out of context, they don't rightly divide. Uh, you know, they try to make a, was it Matthew 24 for today, the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, and there's some other teachings that we're going to talk about here in a bit. Okay. This is why people get so messed up in false doctrine and fables. Okay. Example, Revelation, we talked about that. Pre, post, mid, trib versus pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ. They treat the whole book of Revelation as if it's chronological order because it has to be for our, what we want to believe to be true. But when you actually study 2 Timothy 2.15, you realize it's not chronological order. Well, another thing is that really gets people, the reason I read that, especially here in Genesis, why we use Genesis as the example of things not being in chronological order is, is you turn to Genesis 1.1, it says, in, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Period. And because of that period, people get all kinds of messed up. Because it's like, he created everything. Then verse 2, as we're going to keep reading, he goes back into more detail of his creation. Then when you get chapter 2, he goes into even more detail. He goes back in time and goes into more detail of what he did. Okay? But because of that period there, there's this whole huge theory called the gap theory. And some people try to make it out as gap fact. We'll talk about that a little bit. But gap theory, okay, it's a theory. I have no problem with theories. I really don't. But let's talk, stick with this one before we get into why I don't have a problem with having theories to a point. But remember, we're supposed to be talking mostly about absolute truth. There's nothing wrong with having a theory and throwing it out there, and maybe God showed somebody where you can turn a theory into fact. They might, God might have shown you something that He didn't show me, and it's just for me, it's just a theory. But we should be primarily talking about absolute truth, not getting all bent out of shape and causing division over theories. Okay. Remember we read in verse, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it said, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them... Okay. I'm sorry, chapter, uh, Genesis 2, ch verse 4, where it says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Okay. The generation, like I said, it's not chronological order. Okay. But you see that, but you get to verse 2, it says, and, it goes into more detail of that creation. Verse 3, and, goes into more detail. Verse 4, and, verse 5, and, verse 6, and, and means to add to. I'm going to add more detail to what you just read in Genesis 1-1. But for some people, they can't get chronological order. They think it's got to be chronological order. Why is he recreating after he already said he created. So there must have been another heaven and earth that was destroyed. And then we, we're we actually on the second earth. And then he's got to, uh, then there's going to be a third earth. Okay, I don't believe that. Because the Bible says, heaven and earth, singular, shall pass away. But my word shall not pass away. In three of the four gospels, there's only one earth created right now. There'll be a new earth in the future. There's only two earths mentioned in scripture. Not three. But they'll grab that and try to make it out like there's some kind of gap there. There's a thousand year gap and everything. Why? Because they can't under rightly divide that it's not chronological order. It said this is what he did. But think about it. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's pretty much everything, right? That just so, If you're doing a synopsis of everything, that's pretty much a, a synopsis of everything. But there's a try. Uh, John... 1-1, one, one. in the beginning was the Word, capital W Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Body and soul connected, they're one. God the Father, the soul, is creating all things through Jesus Christ, the body, the Son of God. Okay. This is a synopsis of everything. And some people say, well, wait, wait, it says heaven singular. Yeah, it does. 
But if you know your Bible and you keep reading, uh, Genesis 1, 7, it says, And God made the firmaments and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and in the evening and the morning was the second day. Okay, a day is a 24-hour period. That's why, how do you know it's a 24-hour period? The evening and the morning. God specifically said evening and the morning, and that was the second day. Some people get messed up and say, well, a day to the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. You know why that was told to us, brothers and sisters of Christ? So we can rightly divide when it's talking about the day of the Lord. Day of the Lord is that thousand year period where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign. That's why that was put in there. Okay? Because you know that uh, the time of Jacob's trouble is also called Daniel's 70th week. Week? Well, why is it called Daniel's 70th week? Well, if you go and you learn, read the story about Jacob, where he was working seven years for Rachel, and he ends up getting Leah. And what does Le Laban, Laban, his uncle, say? Well, fulfill your week, and we'll give you Rachel also. After he told him about, well, I can't, it's, it's wrong to give the elder before the younger. But what did he tell him? Fulfill your week, and we'll give you this also. Talking about Rachel. What did Jacob do? He worked another seven years for Rachel. So what can a week be? A week can be seven days, 24-hour 24 24 days. Or in the Bible, it can be a reference to seven years. Daniel's 70th week. It took a while for God to open my eyes and wake me up to that. that that's why that seven-year period, time of Jacob's trouble, it's seven years. I watched a comment under, I think, one of the uh, 33rd Books videos where someone saying, No, the time of Jacob's trouble is only 3.5 years. It's also called Daniel's 70th week. And you, like I said, you use the scriptures. The week that it's talking about there is seven years. It's not 3.5. It's seven years. So don't let me tell you differently. Okay? But we read here, okay, evening and the morning were the second day. They're 24-hour periods. Uh, Genesis 2.1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. But why does it say heaven singular at first, and then it says heavens plural afterwards? Because God divided the heavens into three parts. That's why you have the third heaven, you've got the second heaven, and you've got the first heaven. The first heaven is what we can see from here to the blue skies and everything. The second heaven, the stars. You can only see those at night. But think of daytime. As far as you can see during the day, that's the first heaven. At night, God opens it up and lets us see the stars. Okay, That's the second heaven. The third heaven we can't see is where God's throne is. He separated the heavens. That's why I started out with heavens singular, and then you get heavens plural. It's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm -hmm. Now, why did I bring all this up? Just a quick video, because I'm seeing some brethren sometimes that they'll start arguing over theories. Now, I'm going to get back to what I'm saying. I have no problem with theories. Okay. What I have a problem is, is when people get very prideful, and they say, my theory is a fact. It starts out as a theory, which is okay. And then they say, it's a fact. Well, has anything changed? No. Then how is it a fact? Because I say it is. I'm the final authority. And when you've got respecter of persons, and you've got people that are just fighting over stuff that's not worth fighting over. In these last days, you know what the number one thing we're supposed to be doing, Brother Jesus Christ, action-wise? Individually, Brother Jesus Christ, you should be reading this book, starting your day with this book, and starting your day with prayer. When you first wake up, give God thanks, give God glory, pray, and then open this book and read a chapter in the morning before you even get out of bed. Have your Bible by your bed. Sometimes you can grab a quick verse, get out because you have to do something emergency, and then you can finish reading later. But try to start your day every day with the Word of God and prayer. And you end the day with the Word of God in prayer. Hiding God's Word in your heart, doing your best to, lead, to live it. Give God thanks in all things throughout the day. You give God glory for all things throughout the day. That's the individual. But as the body of Christ, what we're number one thing we're supposed to be really focused on and doing is being a light for Jesus Christ to the world and preaching the gospel. Being a living example, a light, and verbally witnessing for Jesus Christ. Okay, that's our number one purpose for being here. Someone had to remind me, it's like, 
why don't we get caught up, brothers and Christ? Why don't we get just caught right up? As the moment I get saved, why don't I just get caught up? God, just take me home. Why are you and I still here? So we can live it up down here? So we can get rooted in here and comfortable down here? Living our dream life? Family, white picket fence, the house with the white picket fence and a family and everything. So we can live our dream down here? Is that why we're still here? To start being comfortable and loving it down here and become worldly? No. Why are we still down here? So we can be a living testimony for Jesus Christ to the world, to the lost world. So we can keep preaching the gospel to the lost world. I did a video recently saying get back out there and I had some thumbs down on it. Get out there and preach the gospel and I got thumbs down on it. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's why we're still here, brothers of Christ. Any ministry that they're not spending at least a third of their time preaching the gospel and pushing, living a life of Christ so you can be a light to the world and preaching the gospel is a ministry that's starting to go worldly, getting distracted by the world, getting comfortable down here. Be careful about that. Why are we still here? To preach the gospel. And lately among the body of Christ, I've said this before, brothers and Christ, please, please understand, I say this with love, I say this with fear, I say this with sorrow. The body of Christ is in a bad state. Okay, We're getting distracted by what's going on in the world. We're get, we're, we have preachers up there that are becoming covetousness, covetous, and they have many idolatries in their life. They're getting comfortable down here, and they've forgotten their purpose. To preach the gospel and to preach this word. 2 Timothy 2.15, I don't tell you 15, but the Bible says, uh, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? So we can be a light to the world and a testimony to the Lord, to the world. God saved me, the Lord saved me, He can save you. God has given me such peace, He can give you that peace. God has given me real joy, not flesh fun. But real joy, remember, fun is flesh, flesh is fun. He's given me real joy, and He can give you real joy. No matter how bad things get around you, I've got peace and joy, the lost world doesn't. And the world looks at us and goes, I want what they have. We're to be a light for Jesus Christ to the world. Okay? But let me talk in more detail about the thing. I'm going to give you a testimony of how I... There is a brother in Christ out there that he came up with this theory, and there's nothing wrong with it. He came up with a theory for the 24 elders. His theory, and the, he used facts, absolute truth. So the, the truth that he used was is that um, there are 12 national boundaries on the Gentile side, and there are. And he believes that there are two, that the 24 elders are two from each of the natural uh, Gentile boundaries. And I was like... Hmm. He, kind of, he talked really good, good words. Um, um, and it was a good theory based off some facts, but the facts didn't link to his theory. In other words, the facts, that's true. There are 12 national boundaries on the Gentile side. But the, that did not line up with who the 24 elders were, in a sense the Bible doesn't tell us who the 24 elders are. They take off their crowns and throw them at the foot of the cross. Remember, we all get crowns. Okay, the Bible says that every nation, every tongue is going to be there. That includes the Jewish nation. There were Jew a lot of Jews that got saved at the beginning when you had Paul and Peter and John. But over time, the Jews went back to the world. The next generation, generation of that went back to the world. And Jews today, there's hardly any Jews that are truly saved, born again today. Okay. Uh, because uh, the gospel is a stumbling block for him. Their blindness in part has happened to Israel. But he had his theory, and I was like, okay, you got your theory, and he came out and said it's a theory. And I have no problem with that, brothers and sisters. Let's stop right there. I have no problem with that. That doesn't cause division. Well, you got your theory? Well, here's my theory. After I looked into it, I didn't look into it because I didn't really, wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't one of those people. Some people are different. I wasn't one of those people that I read the 24 elders who had the crowns. I don't, for some reason, I never ever jumped up and said, I have to know who these 24 elders are. I have to know. I have to know. Um, but a brother in Christ brought it up, and then it got me curious. So then I started studying it and saying, okay, it still doesn't say who the 24 elders are. But the idea of boundaries, God selecting one of those 24 elders from boundaries, I, can't, I started studying it, and my theory... Okay, 
is that it's one from all the national boundaries. There's actually 24 national boundaries. And I did a study on this. There's an actual 24 national boundaries. Uh, there's 12 on the Gentile side, and there's 12 on the Jew side. Okay? There's 24 national boundaries. And the Bible says you can't serve two masters. You have a, a captain over 50, captain over 10, cap, I think it's captain over 10s, captains over 50s, captains over 100s. You never have two captains over the same group. You can't have two bosses over the same thing. One boss will want it done this way, another boss will want it done this other way, and they're going to clash almost every time, and the people are going to be like, well, who do we follow? Well, whichever one we love the most. Okay, that's why you can't serve two masters. So my theory was is that it's one from each of the 12 tribes. I mean, 12 tribes, and one from each of the 12 national boundaries. So then you've got one from all the boundaries that God ever set, 24 elders. But it's just a theory. I come out and say, it's just a theory. Why? Because I'm not going to add to the Word of God. The Bible doesn't say who those 24 elders are. It doesn't specifically say. We'll find out when we get to heaven, brothers of Christ. You and I will find out when we get to heaven. But this brother in Christ, over time, he came out with another video saying it's his 24 elder theory is now no longer theory. It's fact. And I'm like, okay, maybe God showed him something new. Maybe God showed him something new. And, and now we can know who the 24 elders are. And I'm watching this whole study, and he just says the exact same thing that he said before when it was a theory. He said the same thing. Only now he changed the word theory to fact. And I'm like, but he didn't come up with anything new. There was no hardcore evidence like that, like, you found that nugget of gold that said, okay, here's the 24 elders and who they are. Uh, 33rd book, when he's doing the um, cherubims and what are they, he actually finds in the Bible where it says, it shows us where, what the uh, cherubim are and everything. Okay. But he says it now it's all of a sudden it's fact. And I'm like, uh, just because you say it's fact, it's fact now? And he took it a step further. Not only is it fact, if you can't see what he sees, then you're ignorant of scripture and you can't read plain English. That's where I have a problem with it, brothers and Christ. Same thing with the gap theory. You want to have a theory that there's some kind of gap there? Go for it, as long as you say it's a theory. Because nowhere in the scriptures does it say that there was a thousand, million, billion year gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. That there was another, the old earth was destroyed and the new earth, another earth was created. Some brethren, like Peter Ruckman, I love him, he's my brother in Christ, but he takes con, uh, verses out of context trying to show that the earth was destroyed. I was like, uh, that's not what those verses are talking about. That's a whole other study. But my point here is this. As long as it's a theory, it's not going to cause division. But when you try to say it's a fact, when it's not a fact... What do you do? You start causing division. And it takes a lot of pride. I'm sorry, Brother Christ. It takes a lot of pride to say something is fact and not be able to back it up word for word for the King James Bible. Gap theory is one of those things. You have 24 elders that I just talked about. How pride can get in the way. And when it was a theory, praise the Lord. You have a theory, praise the Lord. A lot of people have theories. But we don't come out and say it's absolute truth unless the Bible says it's absolute truth. Another thing that people are fighting over is flat earth versus globe earth. The Bible, I've, like I said, I've heard good arguments on flat earth. I've heard good arguments on globe earth. You say, which way do you lean? I lean to globe earth. Well, all, and the main reason is, is the one answer that the flat earth people have not been able to answer is, is where's hell at? Oh, it's in the heart of the earth. If the earth is a flat disk, that statement wouldn't be true. The heart means the center. If I have this, it's flat earth, there's no center. It's flat. But I don't have anything that's circle. But see how this is thick? It's a candle. It's thick. But you can say the heart of the candle is right here. You measure from side to side, it's the center. Top to bottom, it's the center, but it's in the very middle. It's inside, inside. But when you have something that's flat, 
Where's the where's where's hell? Oh, it's down here. But but that's not the heart of the earth. If the earth is up here and it's flat, this is the earth. The heart of the earth would be this minuscule thing in here or something. Eh, you know, but like I said, that's me. That's one of the things that they haven't been able to answer. But if you want to believe flat earth, eh. If you want to believe globe earth, eh. It's a theory. Does it change anything in the Bible? No. That gap theory, um, I think the one of the things, reasons why I'm kind of not for the gap theory is a lot of people take that gap theory and try to make it gap fact, and they're trying to indoctrinate evolution. I think that's the dangerous part. They try to indoctrinate evolution. They try to say globe earth is talk, teaching evolution. No, it isn't. That's just a poor attack on globe earth. And then globe people, like I said, I've heard some pathetic arguments against flat earth. I've heard some pathetic arguments against globe earth. But like I said, it becomes arguments. And that's where the danger lies. It's no longer just a theory, hey, we're just talking about this in love with brothers and sisters in Christ. It's just a theory. It turns into debating. It turns into arguing. It turns into division. And it's not worth dividing over. Like I said, I have no problem talking about theories from time to time. But theory should not be the primary thing that you're fighting over, a theory. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live or die by my theory. Uh, why don't you live and die by the gospel? Why don't you live and die, fight and die, for what's already there that's absolute truth that we know is absolute truth. Right? Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 4 says, Neither give heed to fables and English, endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is, of faith, which is in faith, so do. Okay? When you have a theory, it's a theory. There's nothing wrong with throwing a theory out there. But when you start going hardcore on a theory without any truth to back it up, and you start trying to say, well, that, that theory is now fact, no, what you've done is you've created a fable. And we're not to give heed to fables. First okay. Timothy 4.7 says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness, the truth that we do have. Okay? People fighting over stupid stuff. Lately we had people fighting over sin, trying to justify sin under liberty. And they're trying to hold on to worldliness, and that is more important than the Word of God. That's more important than preaching the Gospel. That's more important than being a light for Jesus Christ. And it's causing division in the body of Christ. I came across, that's another rabbit trail, I came across somebody defending uh, video games again. Okay. And he said, well, I, do, I play video games... Uh, not I play. He was mentioned for somebody else, but somebody else plays video games too because he's defending somebody. Plays video games to please the Lord. And that's how he worships God, and that's how he pleases the Lord playing video games. And I just just went like this and went like, you're you're dealing with addiction. You're dealing with people that are flesh carnally minded and walking after the flesh. I was addicted to video games. I love video games. Video games pleased me. I would never dare sit there and say video games. I do. I play video games to please God. I do hella days to please God. Uh, whatever to please God. When it's fleshly, it's all about pleasing me. Yet you've got people out there defending it. Hella days. I'm doing this for God. No, you're doing it for yourself. Look at all the practices that go along with it. It's all about elevating yourself and pleasing you and the flesh and family members. Video games. It's all about pleasing you. Okay. We had to fight that fight, and I'm still fighting that fight among the brethren, that make sure what you do pleases God, and it's biblical. You're doing it for God, and you're getting nothing out of it. If God blesses you with some things, praise the Lord. But what you do for God, you do for Him, not for your flesh. Not for me, myself, and I, that I can get something out of it. Okay, you do it for God regardless. Okay. But here we're seeing people do the same thing when it comes to uh, wise tales, fables. When you have a theory that starts blowing up and becomes a fable, becomes a wise tale, wives tale, fable. Second Timothy 4, 4 says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Here's the truth of the gospel. I don't want to talk about the gospel. I want to talk about the gap theory. I mean, I mean gap fact. I don't want to talk about the gospel. I want to talk about the flat earth theory. I mean, Flat Earth fact. 
or globe earth theory, I mean globe earth fact. Uh, 24 elder theory, I mean 24 elder fact. And they shall turn their ears away from the truth, the things that really matter. Now I gotta push off grid living. I gotta push video games are okay. I gotta push holidays are okay. And and you know, and I gotta push, you know, punkering down instead of getting out and preaching the word and living a life of Christ and being a light to this world, you need to go hide somewhere and we need to bunker down because we gotta endure to the end to be saved. Oh wait. I can't say saved because that that's that, that's an obvious heretic. We have to endure to the end to be caught up. No, I don't have to be, endure to the end to be caught I have to endure hardness as a good soldier, but I don't have to endure to the end to be saved. I don't have to endure to the end to be caught up. If God chooses to take me home early, he takes me home, I mean early compared to the, the catching away the body of Christ. Sometimes he can bring you home early because of your sins and you just, you're just becoming a worthless Christian and God's tried to help you, chastise, chastise, you won't listen, he'll just bring you home early. Kill you and bring you home early. But what I meant by early is before the time of Jacob's trouble. If God calls me home before the time of catching away the body of Christ, I mean, we're all going to go before the time of Jacob's trouble. But the catching away the body of Christ, if I don't get to be there as far as being alive, we all get to be there. The dead in Christ rise first. We're all going to be there at the catching away. That's one thing I learned too. We always, got, we always try to push. We want to be there. We want to be there alive. But brothers and Christ, everyone's going to be there. And the church age, that's from the church age, are going to be there to catch away the body of Christ. The dead in Christ rise first. Paul's going to be there. Peter's going to be there. We're all going to be there. Okay? But if I die because I'm standing up and I'm preaching the word and the world gets so hard and it gets so horrible like it is today, but it's going to get worse. If I'm preaching God's word, preaching the gospel and being a light to the world so the world can see me, you put the candle the light on a candlestick, not behind a bushel, and no one can see the light. You put it up so all can see the light. If I end up getting thrown in prison and getting killed, then that's God's will. We're supposed to endure hardness, not hide from it. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangling himself with the affairs of this life. Oh, look what's going on out there. And, and you know, i got to live my dream life. And, and i got my family that i got to take care of. And, and i got to do this. And i got to do that. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life who he hath chosen to be a soldier. You get called into full-time ministry. You need to actually trust the Lord to help you take care of your family. And you need to put away all these idols that's in your life. This covetousness which is idolatry. And you need to be content with food and raiment. Sorry, I went off a little bit of a tra rabbit trail. But brothers says Christ, there are more important things than these um, fables. We need to be preaching the Word of God. We need to preach instruction righteousness. We need to be preaching doctrine. We need to be doing word studies, subject studies, expository studies. Okay? We need to be exhorting the brethren. We don't need to be fighting and bickering over sin. We need to stop fighting and bickering and be on the same page. Sin is sin. Get it out of your life. Stop justifying it. Get it out of your life. We need to be on the same page that covetousness is idolatry. You need to get that idolatry out of your life. We need to be on the same page that this is what's important. The truth that God actually shows us. Absolute truth, not theories. That's what's important, brothers and Christ. And you need to get out there. And you need to be a light to this world. You need to be a... Also, sometimes your light can be stronger than another brother's light. And you can go exhort, encourage, correct... Rebuke a brother whose light's gone dim, so that light can grow, get brighter again. Like I said, when you correct a brother in Christ or rebuke a brother in Christ, it's to build them back up, not to destroy them. It's to tear down that evil wickedness so that bad stuff falls off. Let's say you're chipping away the bad stuff, and then you build them back up so that light is brighter for Jesus Christ. Your whole point is to get them back to a standing position, not to destroy them and tear them down. Okay, if you love the gap theory and you're honest, gap theory, I'm not against you. Okay, like I said, I get frustrated when you make it out to be a fact and, it be, and you're trying to make it out to be major doctrine, and it's not. You start uh, causing division over it, arguing, bickering over it. Same thing with 24 elders. Like I said, I was really shocked that Brother Christ I love very much. 
I was really shocked. He's like, it's fact. And if you can't see it, then you're ignorant of scripture and you can't read any plain English. And I'm like, okay, show me the plain new English where it tells us specifically who the 24 elders are. He couldn't do it. Flat earth people fighting and arguing versus the globe earth. Fighting and arguing. Titus 1.14 says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and co commandments of men that turn from the truth. There's this time period where Jesus Christ he's warning Timothy hardcore. Uh, if it's a theory, it's a theory. There's nothing wrong with mentioning a theory casually. But don't start getting into theories as if they're major doctrine. And start turning those theories into fables. Stay away from that. Okay? It's going to cause division. It's going to cause people to start backbiting and whispering. Okay? 2 Peter 1.16, this is in Peter, it says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Cunningly devised fables. Some people, you've got to be careful, they're very cunning. Post a mid-trib, that's a fable. Big time. Okay? Pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. The body of Christ leaves. There's three catching aways. One happened when Jesus was raised from his dead. There's three parts to the resurrection. First part happened when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. The second part happens at the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. And the third one happens, I think it's three point, that's what gets people confused. That's why they say the time of Jacob's trouble is only 3.5 years. Because at 3.5 years, there's a catching away inside the time of Jacob's trouble that completes the full resurrection. But there's actually seven years in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, Daniel's 70th week. If we have followed cunning, for we have not followed cunningly, cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The day of, G of the Lord is not a fable. Him coming back with, on horses and with the saints, the angels, that's not a fable. The time of Jacob's trouble is not a fable. The catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble is not a fable. Post and mid-trib are. People saying there is the day of the Lord already happened, back in such and such, and invisibly, back in such and such. I think that was Je the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's a fable. There's so many fables out there. Okay? One of the biggest fables that's really hurting the world right now is we have religion, every false religion everywhere, professing a Jesus Christ, and they're promoting false gospels. They're creating false converts. They're giving you fables. They promise you, this is the time of Jacob's trouble, that they promise them liberty, but they take the mark and worship the beast, they go to hell. Okay, they don't have the liberty that we have today. We're sealed into the day of redemption. No amount of sin today, once you get saved and sealed, no amount of sin is going to cause you to lose your salvation. Okay? We have liberty. But in that time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to be told they have liberty when they don't. They have a command they've got to keep. Don't take the mark and worship the beast. They go hand in hand. You do that, you lose your salvation. But there's people today saying, oh, no, that's not true. That's, they're, they're preaching fables. You can take the mark. Or this other teaching, no Christian would ever take the mark. And I'm like, I ain't an idiot, like, like some of them, those people are out there. I look at myself and said, as a saved sinner, did I fail the Lord Many, many times. Oh, yeah. When I was newly saved, I fell back into video games. Um, video games. Hollywood movies, TV shows, porn. I was struggling to get out of all that stuff when I got newly saved. And I failed the Lord several times. There are brethren still failing the Lord today. Okay, there's times where I failed Him elsewhere in other areas. I thought that was all I had to worry about. And God said, okay, we got this out of your life. Now let's start putting a spotlight on these other things. And God woke me up and said, okay, I'm not doing this like I'm supposed to. I failed to do that. I gave in to the world and did this. Okay. I look at myself and go, I'm still capable of sin. I have this body of flesh that tempts me and I fail the Lord and I choose to sin sometimes still. I'm not sinlessly perfect. My soul is. Why? Because it's connected to Jesus Christ. My soul can't sin. It's connected to Jesus Christ. But my body still, this body of flesh, hasn't been redeemed. And I look and I go, 
I'm still capable of sin. And if I'm capable of sin, you're telling me that in the time of Jacob's trouble, when things are harder than there is today, I'm sinning today as a saved sinner. I'm not justifying it. I'm stating a fact. We still sin as sinners, and we're not supposed to. Get that through your head, brothers and sisters of Christ, and all those other people out there that profess to be saved. We're not supposed to sin. It happens, but we're not supposed to use that fact that we're still a sinner as justification for sin. I've heard, brethren, they take the, um, the saying that's true. It says, God will not allow man to be perfect. You're going to have preachers up there that are going to make mistakes or they're going to be wrong somewhere. That's called a fact. But what's happened in these last days is you hear brethren taking their ministry, take that fact and make it an excuse. So in other words, look the other way. Keep your yap shut. Uh, no, we're supposed to have grace. God, I'm not, that's what the whole point of that fact is, is we're supposed to have grace. I'm still a sinner. You're still a sinner, brother, says Christ. So when I go to correct you, I'm supposed to have grace, knowing that God had grace for me in my sins. That God forgave me of my sins when I didn't deserve it. I need to have grace for you, brother, says Christ, and how I go about correcting you. It doesn't mean we look the other way and say, okay, we're going to be sinners anyway, so we just ignore it and it's, it's okay. Now we use it as an excuse to justify sin. No, we don't. Okay. Sorry, another little rabbit trail thing, but cunning devices, cunning devices. The Bible talks about using good words and fair speeches. I'm coming to you with absolute truth. These are the words I'm trying to use. And like I said, where, where it seems like I'm so right, I'm not. When it seems like I'm right, it's because God's word's right and I'm lining up with the scriptures. And when I'm wrong, it's not because the, wor the word of God is wrong, it's because I'm not lining up with the scriptures. But I come to you with this. Not my own words and my own feelings and opinions and theories and fables and whatnot. That's why you've got to be careful about that, brothers and Christ. What's important? You need to start, I think one of the biggest thing, teachings we need to do eventually is priorities. What are your priorities? Are your priorities all screwed up? And some of you brothers in Christ in ministry know who I'm talking about. Are your priorities all screwed up? Brothers and through Christ, is my, I, me in ministry, is my priorities all screwed up? As a brother and sister in Christ, is my priorities all screwed up? What are your priorities, brothers and Christ? Your number one priority should be that you're hiding God's word in your heart and living it so you can be a light to the world to lead people to Christ. Preaching the gospel. Gospel tracting. Mm -hmm. Don't fall into it. When you say fact, that's absolute, that's another way of saying absolute truth. Be careful. It better be absolute truth. Whereas if it's just a theory, you're causing division in the body of Christ. Brethren have divided over the gap theory and went their separate ways over something that's just a theory. I don't part ways with somebody who, who believes in, who, who, who likes the gap theory and loves talking about the gap theory. That's just not me. Uh, but when you try to say it's a gap fact, there's people dividing over it. It's doctrine. It's, made, it's not doctrine. Major doctrine. It's not doctrine at all. It's a theory. Flat earth versus globe earth. It's major doctrine. And if you don't believe what I believe, you're lost. And I have to break fellowship with you. 24 elders. People breaking fellowship over 24 elders. People breaking... Uh, lately, it just seems like there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing sneaking in, trying to cause division. But it's just Christ. When I preach against sin, I'm trying to bring unity. When I preach against covetousness, which is idolatry, and you know who you are, that's trying to justify it among the brethren, you're causing division. I'm trying to bring unity. This is our foundation in all matters of faith and practice. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do. God got it out of my life. I'm trying to help you get it out of yours by preaching truth to you. All right? But when you have these people, if this is a theory, this is a this is goes from theory to fact. This is a fact. They're causing division. Uh, there was brethren that were false brethren, wolves in sheep's clothing, that were coming out and using apocryphal books to do Bible studies and prove their point because this book here didn't prove their point. So they decide to put this book down and grab some apocryphal books that would prove their point. They go outside the Bible. Stay away from those people. Run from those people that go from outside the Bible and try to grab books 
from outside the Bible to prove their point because the Bible doesn't. That's not a Bible believer. That's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Stay away from them. Run from them. Okay? Remember, rightly divide the word of truth. The whole point of this study was is there's times in the Bible, I think most of the time, that you find fault, the false teachings, oftentimes it's because they did two things. They took something that was written for a different dispensation and they're trying to apply it for today. That's one. But another thing I'm realizing that's causing a lot of false teachings out there is you got people that don't want to rightly divide when it comes to, is it a retelling of the story? Is God retelling? He retells his story. I mean, you get through... Um, I get through Genesis all the way through first, second, first and Second Kings, and it seems like for the most part you're getting through most of the story before you start getting into the prophets. But then you hit Chronicles. What does Chronicles do? First and Second Chronicles. It goes back and talks about different things of the kings, King David, uh, Solomon. This king. It goes back through and is a retelling in more detail, and you can get tidbits of information that wasn't there in 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st 2nd Samuel, 1st 2nd Kings, there's stories in 1st and 2nd Chronicles that you're like, wow, I didn't know that. It, that gives you some more information. But it's a retelling of the story in more detail. And I believe that's the second reason brethren are getting messed up. Is they think this has all got to be chronological order or where they want it. Not all, because like I said, nobody makes the confusion of two atoms. Okay? But why is it they can't make they don't make a confusion of the two atoms, but they make a confusion of Genesis 1-1. They get so confused with Revelation chapter 8, I think it is. Um, I keep saying it, but I kind of like to make sure I'm getting the right one. But it's six. Yeah. I think it's six. But it's not in my notes, but um, one of the verses is just, it's a synopsis, but they get messed up because they're like, well, I don't want it to be, I want it to be chronological order so I can believe what I want to believe, okay? And they say the same thing about us, you don't want it to be chronological order. Well, no, it's not chronological order. There's not two times of Jacob's trouble, okay? There's not, you know, there's not two seven-year periods where... God goes through the seven-year period. Oh, now there's another seven-year period when God goes into more detail about what's going on in that seven-year period. Oh, no, there's not two times of Jacob's trouble. There's just one. You're just failing to rightly divide the word of truth. Brothers and sisters in Christ, just I didn't mean for this to be that long and ramble a little too much, so please forgive me. But there's things worth fighting for, and there's things that are just theories that are worth talking about sometimes. Because there's times I ask about, like, what's it going to be like in heaven? And talk with the brethren. Uh, what's it going to be like in the thousand-year reign? Um, you know, sometimes, I, right now, one of the studies I'm working on is angels. You know, what's their, what's their job? What's the task of an angel? You know, some days we're going to be as the angels. I don't believe we're actual angels, but we're like the angels that are up there. But we're going to be a type of angel. We're referred to as angels. But um, but the thing I'd like to, like theory I haven't really gotten into, but talk with some of the brethren is um, angels can sin. Right now, the angels that exist right now that God created, they can sin. You had some that came, that left their first estate and came down, and they're reserved in chains of darkness under the earth. That's the, what's the time about. Those are the angels that are reserved in hell and chains of darkness, waiting for the day of judgment. Okay. Then you have the third of the angels that fall um, at the catching away. We go up, and then Satan and a third of the angels come down. He, the, the red dragon with his tail grabs a third of the stars and brings a third of the angels down with him. Okay. Those angels sinned against God. So angels can sin. We will get an incorruptible body. And like I said, it's just stuff that you like to talk about. I like to talk about things. Don't get me wrong. I like to talk about things that I don't have absolute truth. I don't know the whole thing. I don't know. I'm still learning. But the things that are really important, brothers and sisters Christ, that we're not talking about a lot in these days is the gospel. That's one thing that's very important. We're not talking about it that much. Right? Um, we need to get back out there and keep witnessing for Jesus Christ. We need to be a living witness. A living witness for Jesus Christ. It's not about running to the hills to hide. It's about standing out there where the world can see you and be a light to the world. 
Now, I sent, I, I, uh, one of the studies I threw up that was an old, old study, I talked about how sometimes we got to be stealthy about how we go about things, depending on how, like if you're in a country where Christianity is outlawed, and they find uh, you as, you're a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, you get hung or burnt at the stake, you've got to be a little stealthy about how you present the gospel to people. You still live right, you try to do right, but when you're gospel tracting, you've got to be a little bit more, you know, wise, um, just using discernment. Okay? But brothers and sisters Christ, that hasn't happened yet. For most, uh, there's some countries that it's hard, but for at least for America, it hasn't happened yet. We still have the doors are open. We still have the freedom to go out there and preach the gospel. We still have the freedom to go out there and lay gospel tracts everywhere. We still have the freedom to hand people gospel tracts without getting beaten to a pulp and thrown in prison. Like Paul was. Like Peter was. Okay? John was exiled to the island of Patmos. That's not happening to us today in, here in America. We can still preach truth. The doors might close someday. But until they do, we need to focus on things that are important, brothers and sisters of Christ. I normally don't say this, but can I get an amen on that? We need, this world desperately needs the gospel, the true gospel, the real Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying there's going to be a huge revival, because some people will hold that against me. Who's going to be? I pray for a revival, and lately I've been praying for a revival in the body of Christ. That God will wake us up, get our priorities straight. Get the sin out of our life that's getting in the way of us living for Jesus Christ every day. It's getting in the way of our fellowship with the brethren to get that covetousness, which is idolatry, out of brethren's lives. I pray, Lord, do something to shake the body of Christ up, to wake us up, to bring us back together and unite us, that kind of revival. Um, but as far as salvation revival, I don't know. There's still people, why are we still here, brothers and that, That's I do know. Why are we still here, brothers and Christ? Because there's people out there that still need to get saved. That's the only other reason why we're here. There's brethren out there that need to get saved. And we need to get out there and get witnessing again and get, get preaching again. We need to exhort the brethren. Okay? We do need fellowship. Not need. We want fellowship. Um, Hebrews is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble when it says, Forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together. But I'm telling you right now, this is a one more time of warning. I'm going to keep bringing it up from time to time, brothers of Christ. You can have all the excuses in the world. But I know, brethren, that they could have had a house church by now, and they don't. They could have gone back to street witnessing and gospel tracting ministry, and they don't. And the Lord had to really break my heart, the jealousy of they could do it and they won't do it. I want to do it, and right now it's just not what God wants from me, or else it would come together. But I'm warning you, brothers and Christ, while the internet's still up and running for us, up and running period, and up and running for us, so that we can use it for God's glory, even though it's primar primarily used for wickedness and sin, for Satan. We can still email each other. We can still contact each other. You guys need to start praying about whether God wants you to start forming house churches, and if it requires you to move, not to hide in the hills, off-grid living and hiding in the hills, but if he wants you to move to be part of a house church or to help start a house church, you guys need to start praying for it because now's the time to be doing that. To start trying to put together house churches all over, I say America, but anywhere you are, okay? Start trying, even if it's a house church of three people, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You just need two to have a house church. People think house church, I can't put together a house church, that's a million people. You just need two to start it. And you get out there and start witnessing two by two, and you start leading people to Christ and you bring them in. You lead another person to Christ. Now you got four. Now you got five. I'm not saying there's going to be a huge revival, but in these last days, if God tarries and we go through some really hard times, we're desperately going to need fellowship. We're going to need exhortation. We're going to need correction from one another. Uh, we need to be rebuked by one another, okay, through the scriptures to keep us on the right path, clear up to the end as far as being caught up. We need to stand. It's not that we have to endure to the end. We need to stay in a standing position to the end. How many brethren have fallen and gone the way of the world? They've turned their back on the Bible as God's perfect written word. They've turned their back on the true plan of salvation for easy believism, and they're justifying the world. 
And there's just, Paul talks about Demas, I think it is, hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He had a man in ministry that knew truth, that fought for the truth for so many years, and yet he fell away. That can happen to any of us. What helps us? Paul, for the longest time, and I'll be doing probably another study on this, John even said this, I hope to be with you. Paul's like, I want to see you again. He wanted to be with you face to face. Okay. Why did Paul say, I need your help. I need you to bring so-and-so. I need you to bring this person. Titus, uh, Silas, um, Timoth uh, Timothy. Okay. I need some help, brethren. We're supposed to be working together. We're supposed to be striving together. Okay. Let's get back to what's important. Don't fall in the trap of fighting over theories. And remember, sin's not, it's not worth it. Idolatry is not worth it. Okay? Please, 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 don't fall into the trap of thinking this book has to be chronological order. And you fall for Satan's lies and deceptions, trying to make up all these different doctrines that I... To this day, you're still, they're still coming up with weird doctrines. I mean, you hear the Jehovah's Witnesses and what they believe. I was like, how do they get that? That's not in the scriptures at all. It's a theory that became a fact. That's ultimately what it is. It was somebody else's feelings and opinions, a theory, that became fact for that false religion. And so on Mormons. And so on Catholicism was based off of pagan religion to begin with. But you know what I'm saying? You hear some really crazy theories and stories out there, and they act like it's fact, and there's so much division among them. A lot of backbiting, whispering going on these false religions and these professing Christians. It's like, why? Because they can't stand for absolute truth. They don't want repentance as part of salvation. They don't want to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And they don't want the changed life after salvation. They don't want the new life, the new birth, the new creature in Christ Jesus. They don't want to change, they don't want to, they understand, I'm, they're not fools, brothers of Christ. I used to think maybe they were deceived, they're not. Okay, most part, some might be, I'm sorry, I can't say they all aren't. But for the most part, what it is, is they, they're smart, flesh smart, wisdom, man's wisdom. If I get saved, that means God's the master, the Lord of my life, and he tells me what to do. And that means he cleans up my life, that means no more drinking, alcohol. That means no more smoking cigarettes and weed and drugs. That means no more fornication. That means no more Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games. That means I have to give up holidays. Right? That means I gotta, you know, give up cussing. Whatever. That means that after I get saved, I belong to Him. And it's like He's gonna clean my life up, and these things don't please God, but they please me. But they don't please God. Well, I want to hold on to these things. So they reject the true plan of salvation that has repentance in it. They don't have sorrow for their sin. They love their sin. They, can, they plan on keeping their sin. They love it. They're holding, what the Bible says, what uh, King David said, if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. They're holding iniquity in their heart. They're not coming to God broken and having sorrow for those sins, taking that iniquity out of their heart and throwing it at the foot of the cross. It's not about cleaning up your life and then getting saved. It's saying after salvation, your life gets cleaned up. That was always expected. That was always expected. You know what they used to do? They used to preach the lost world. They used to preach the do's and the don'ts. Hey, you're not supposed to be drinking. Drunkenness is a sin to a lost person. Hey, you're not supposed to be cussing like that. It's a sin. You're not supposed to be doing it. Why are you preaching against sin against lost people? Because it lets them know that they are sinners and that they need Jesus Christ. They're going to hell because of those sins. And they need Jesus Christ. Today, people think they're good people. Why? Because nobody's preaching against sin to the lost world. It's just God's love. It's just God's love. Easy believism. God's love. They're not preaching against sin. That's what's popular. we got to get out there and say, okay, you are a sinner. The Bible says you're a sinner. And you need to have sorrow for that sin. That sin isn't worth it. You need to let go of that sin and throw it at the foot of the cross. Stop hiding in your heart. Stop clinging to it. Stop holding on to it. Okay. I'm going and going, but brothers of Christ, there's more important things. I'm sorry, brothers of Christ, for going off. There's more important things to fight. We need to be standing for the gospel. We need to be out there preaching it. Gospel tracting, handing out gospels. I got to preach to a brother. Or, sorry. I got to preach to not a brother. 
I got to preach the gospel to a man up, up the road. Um, and boy, was he sitting there dancing on the fence and mocking God. And he, you know, he's mocking, you know, you think Santa Claus is going to say, he actually brought up Santa Claus is going to save me through and Christmas and this and that. And, and he just, he just really mocked God. And he desperately needs Jesus Christ. And I'm sitting there and he's like, are you afraid to go to hell? And I was like, I was. There was a time I was scared to death of hell. See, because he, he came out of Catholicism, and he knows Catholicism, he knows Jehovah's Witness, he knows Mormon, he knows a lot of these false religions, but he won't let go of all those lies and deception and, and cling to the truth. I said, he was shocked when I said that. I said, I'm not afraid anymore. He was shocked. It almost brought his tantrum and putting on a show. It, he just came to a complete stop. and was like, what do you mean you're not scared? I know where I'm going when I die. Because the Catholics don't know. They can't. That's, that's the sin of presumption. They can't know where they go when they die. I was like, I know exactly where I'm going when I die. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. My soul gets to go to heaven when I die. I know exactly where I'm going. I don't have fear of hell anymore. And that shocked him. And kind of sobered him a little bit. And I don't know if that reached him, but... I'm still praying that every time I go for a walk and he wants to talk, any time a door opens up, I, I give it to him. And brothers and sisters Christ, you need to get the courage to do the same thing. You need to be going out and going for walks. Okay, when you go to town to do some shopping, you need to have a couple areas that you have that you go around gospel tracting. Take 30 minutes out of your day when you go into town to do shopping to go somewhere and gospel tract. Witness for Jesus Christ. I walk on the beach. I try to hand out gospel tracts. When the door opens, I try to witness. That's what's important. This is important, hiding it in our heart and living it, so we can be a living testimony, so people don't look at us as hypocrites. And we're supposed to verbally be preaching Jesus Christ. That's what's important, Brother Jesus Christ. And that's what I've been trying to preach on a lot lately. I do love the Bible. I love doing Bible studies, word studies, subject studies, uh, expository studies, preaching doctrine and everything. But with the way the world's going... You know, with isolation, purposely trying to isolate everybody, whether you're saved or not, everybody. We need to get back out there. We need to get back to preaching the gospel. There's a bad attitude going around in the brethren that, well, nobody really wants the gospel. And, you know, well, what's the point? There's no, not going to be a revival, so what's the point? And, and doors are closing. And, and what is this? That's called a bad attitude. You're letting your flesh, evil spirits... Satan, talk you out of gospel tracting and continue going strong. I don't care if a mil if I preach to a million people and 999,000 people blew me off like I was nothing, the gospel tracts that I gave, threw, throw them away, rip them up, throw them away, mock me. It's that one person that you plant a seed. Like I said, that man up there on the hillside that lives up away, it sobered him. It made him just, I'm telling you, he was acting like, I mean, he was actually jumping around on the fence like, ooh, this is going to save me, that's going to save me, this. And he's mocking, but he's using all these lies that the world has told him that are wrong. And he's mocking, he's mocking. And when I told him that, it just, he just stopped. Oh. Well. I mean, everything, his whole demeanor changed a little bit. It's that one person that we get to plant a seed that matters, brothers and sisters Christ. It's that one person that we water, that gets, we get to water a seed that's been planted. Okay, we need to get back to what's important, brothers and sisters Christ. We need to be united in these last days. Things are getting so difficult. Things are getting so hard out there for us as Christians trying to preach the gospel. And you have brethren that are promoting division, backbiting, whispering, railing for railing, false accusations, bearing false witness. That's not how we need to be, brothers and sisters Christ. You've got brethren that are, trying, that are choosing sins over fellowship and doing the work of the Lord. They're choosing idolatry over fellowship and doing the work of the Lord. We need to come together. And when you've got all these theories, that doesn't bring unity. There's nothing wrong with talking about a theory, but we need to realize that when it starts getting heated, we need to talk about truth. You start talking about the gap theory, let's say you believe in it, I don't, um, and it's a theory. If we start talking about it and we start getting heated, we need to go... Okay, we need to put it to the side for right now. Let's go talk about the gospel. Let's talk about uh, eternal security. 
Let's talk about the pre-time Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. Hey, let's read some stories in the Old Testament about Old Testament characters and see if we can get some instruction in righteousness. Get to things that are absolute truth, that matter. Don't let things get in the way, brother, says Christ. So sorry, I kept going a little bit further. So grace and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pray for me, brother, says Christ. Pray, pray, pray for me. I, it's on my heart. I'd love to have a house church, but I'm just one person. If another brother or uh, brother and sister in Christ come down here, a brother in Christ, I can, we can have a house church and start going out two by two and do more proactive witnessing. I'm already doing the best I can, one person, but proactive witnessing when you have two or three witnesses. Okay? Uh, and do a house church. I'd love to have a house church. I'm getting a little burnt out on videos in the sense that I, I want fellowship. I want to be able to sing hymns with the brethren, face-to-face -face fellowship, face-to-face -face preaching, hearing fa preaching face-to-face, -face, and preaching face-to-face, -face. Um, encouraging brethren face-to-face. -face. I'm just technology, all this, it's, I think it's kind of pulling us away from doing things God's way. And when someone claims to be full-time ministry, they need to be having, if they don't have a house church, when they could have a house church and they claim they're full-time ministry, they're not full-time ministry. Um, uh, gospel tracking, street witnessing, um, full-time ministry means full-time ministry. You have a flock there that you're taking care of, physical flock. And that's what we need to go back to what full-time ministry is, not online stuff. I've never claimed to be full-time ministry. I know there's other brethren out there that have never claimed to be full-time ministry. And if you want to donate to brethren that are doing videos online, go for it, okay? There's nothing wrong with helping brethren out. But I'm saying the Bible way of full-time ministry is having a physical flock there. And that's what, as far as uh, a, a bishop is concerned, I'm sorry, as far as a bishop is concerned. If you claim to be a bishop, where's your house church? If you claim to be an ordained elder, where's the house church? If you claim to be a, a deacon, where's the house church? Oh, we don't have any. It's online. There's no such thing as an online ordained elder. Online. See, that's all technology junk that's Satan, that Satan's doing. We need to go back. Remember the old paths. Where's the old way? And cling to it. We need to go back to doing things the old way. But I'm going back to this again. Warning again. We might not be on the internet for that long. Okay, if you wait until the world falls apart like it's going to because God's bringing this about, and then you say, okay, now I want to start a house church. It might be possible. God, with God, all things are possible. I'm not saying it's not possible for you to get a house church going, but it's going to be a lot harder. When you can be working on it now, today, and trying to put stuff together, doing it last minute, it's going to be a lot harder. I'm telling you, it's going to be a lot harder. So, grace and peace. Grace and peace is what I want for the brethren. Okay? Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love, my love for all of you, even the ones that have turned their back on me, even the ones that have backbiting and whispered against me, even the ones that have bared false witness against me, my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.